Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Wallapa Bay Fisheries discussion uh, as part of the North of Falcon process. I'm just going to give us a few minutes here to reach critical mass, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, I think our participant list has uh, leveled off here. So I'll go ahead and get started uh, with just, you know, Zoom meet, call logistics and ground rules. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Um, so we are in the Zoom platform. Uh, and so you can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We will keep folks muted during the beginning of our program and then unmute you and we open it up for questions and feedback. Callers can unmute themselves by pressing star six on their phones. Uh, we ask that you raise your hand to ask a question and you can access this through the control panel at the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants and callers can raise their hand by dialing star nine. Please do be respectful of others. Keep your phone muted uh, when others are talking. Uh, be tough on issues and questions, but not on people or organizations. Please don't uh, pursue any personal attacks, insults, or threats. Um, listen and speak and act professionally and allow for a balance of speaking time. Um, if you do have technical issues during the call, you can use the chat button. We'll help you through those. Um, but don't use the chat for questions or comments. Uh, we'll, we're going to take those live at the end, and, and we should have plenty of time to do so. Next slide, please. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marlene Wagner, and we're here this evening as part of our 2022 North of Falcon process. And tonight our focus is on Willapa Bay. We have handouts for tonight's meeting posted on our website and staff will be referencing these materials as we move through the presentation. And so our presentation overview and meeting agenda, uh, we're first gonna be introducing our staff involved with North of Falcon in the Willapa Bay region. We'll review a little bit about the North of Falcon process, revisit the salmon forecast that we went over on March 3rd, and then we'll talk about our 2022 management objectives for the upcoming season, and finally present modeled fishing scenarios. Next slide, please. So our purpose tonight as part of the North of Falcon process is to both provide information and to hear your thoughts about the fisheries this year and discuss options that we may want to consider as we're crafting potential seasons and scenarios. At the end of our presentation, we'll answer questions and take comments about the fisheries. And we're gonna be especially keen to get your input for fisheries modeling. Next slide, please. Here we have the staff organization chart for Willapa Bay. Uh, most of these folks are with us here tonight. Again, my name is Marlene Wagner. At, I'm the South Coast uh, Willapa Bay Grace Harbor Fishery Policy Lead. Uh, I work on the statewide salmon management team, <clears throat> excuse me, under Mark Baltzell, our statewide salmon and steelhead manager, and Kyle Addix, our intergovernmental salmon manager. 
in Region 6, James Losey is our Regional Fish Program Manager. Rob Allen is the Hatchery Reform and Operations Manager. Jody Pope is our District Fish Biologist. And Barb McClellan and Lyle Jennings are the Area bi Biologists that work alongside Jody. Um, next slide, please. So what is North of Falcon? Uh, North of Falcon is the annual cooperative process to set salmon seasons in Washington waters. This name refers to waters north of Oregon's Cape Falcon, uh, and this marks the southern border of Washington's management of salmon stocks. Um, north Falcon is just one component of a larger salmon setting process that also involves uh, the state, tribal governments, federal regulator regulators, and other US states, as well as Canada. Next slide, please. And here again is a brief overview of that North of Falcon process. Uh, we start with forecasting abundances of each stock, and then we can determine if there is a harvestable surplus. Uh, once we've determined what the harvestable surplus is, if any, we model the fisheries to determine which stocks are constraining, and we predict what we will catch under different fishing circumstances. Uh, this is the ongoing process that we're currently in. Um, and then we, we negotiate with our tribal co-managers and other states for sharing of stock allocations. Next slide, please. Um, so here you can see the schedule of meetings for the remainder of our North of Falcon season. Uh, and here we are tonight, March 24th, to go over forecasts and open a discussion about our fisheries in Willapa Bay. Uh, on the 30th, we have a second North of Falcon meeting where we meet with co-managers and refine fisheries planning models. We'll meet with you again on April 5th to further discuss preferred fishery options uh, for this year uh, before the final PFMC meeting. Uh, links on this page are clickable and an entire schedule is available at the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So here you can see, uh, PFMC Ocean Alternatives. So earlier this month, the Pacific Fishery Management Council set ocean alternatives for this year, uh, and they're listed in this table for both Chinook and Coho. I'm not going to read every number here, uh, but uh, of particular note is that Coho stocks are substantially up from last year, and, and that leaves our low option with an intact fishery. Next slide, please. This slide shows our marine area annual ocean quotas from 2003 to 2021. The black dots and black lines represent non-treaty quotas and the gray dots and gray lines represent treaty quotas with Chinook on the left and Coho on the right. The take home here really is that both the state and tribal fisheries take fish in the ocean. Uh, and we do account for these, these numbers when determining our terminal run fisheries. Next slide, please. So the next two slides are our review, again, from our forecast meeting earlier this month. So we're all up to speed. Um, so here we have Willapa Bay, Chinook, Coho, and Chum trends from 2010 to 2022. The terminal run size is shown with the gray dots and gray lines, and escapement is depicted in black dots and black lines. Um, escapement goals are represented with the horizontal green line uh, and green numbers, and this year's predicted run size is shown in blue. Uh, so you'll note here that the forecast for Chinook is below the conservation goal, but we are forecasting a decent increase in the number of coho and a decrease in the number of chum. Next slide, please. So this year's forecast for Chinook is 3,071 natural origin fish, 30,071 hatchery fish. For coho, we have forecasted 35,776 natural origin fish and 74,707 hatchery fish. And for chum, we have 46,810 natural origin fish, 996 hatchery fish for a total of 47,806 total chum. Next slide, please. So our, our 22, excuse me, our 2022 management objectives for Chinook and Willapa Bay come from guidance that was actually provided last year from the Fish and Wildlife Commission, and, and it, that is to be carried over to this season. 
So the, the department is directed to actively manage not to exceed a 20% natural origin Chinook impact rate in both Nacelle and Willapa rivers. Uh, commercial fisheries will not have time and area restrictions south of area 2T. We will determine daily limits for recreational fisheries that achieve management objectives for Chinook and Coho, while also providing for a full recreational season um, that is intended to achieve recreational priority for Chinook. Uh, we'll also continue the development and implementation of test fisheries and in-season update models and hatchery fish uh, will be released at their facility of origin. Next slide, please. Um, our management objectives for coho and chum uh, come straight from the Willapa Bay Salmon Management Policy, C3622. Uh, so for coho in priority order, our first objective is to achieve the aggregate spawner goal of 13,600 wild coho and then prioritize commercial fishing opportunities um, in September through the middle of October, and then provide recreational fishing opportunities. Uh, for chum, our objectives are to manage to achieve the aggregate spawner goal for naturally spawning fish of 35,400, uh, provide commercial fishing opportunities, and then to provide recreational fishing opportunities. And so at this point, I'm going to hand the microphone over to our district fish biologist, Jody Pope. Thank you. Thanks, Marlene. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Jody Pope, the district fish biologist for Willapa Bay. And again, as this has been said before, the information provided on this particular slide was sent out to those of you on our distribution list, and they're also available online. But uh, if you didn't receive this or would like to be added to our distribution list, please just let us know. We're happy to include you in, in all of this. So I'm going to walk you through the starting fisheries model output summary for model A. This model includes new abundances with last year's fisheries. This model is often referred to as the NALF model run, new abundances, last year's fisheries. And for anyone who may not be familiar with planning fisheries in Willapa Bay, we have a model that's called the Terminal Area Management Model. It's also referred to as the TAM. The TAM is a model that us Willapa Bay managers use to model different fisheries proposals and packages that are suggested by you, the public. Uh, while we don't have a slide of that actual planning model this evening, you did receive this in your email and it's also available on the web. It's the one that contains the multiple different colored boxes so just to reiterate again, this effort tonight is to help provide you meaningful information to understand where we stand today and help us build fisheries for the 2022 season. So here on this side, you, on this slide, excuse me, <clears throat> the top table is model A, the now front output that's broken into different sections. Those include the expected natural Chinook impact rate, the expected escapements, the total expected harvest broken out by sector based on policy priorities, the allocation percentages by sector, as well as the number of scheduled commercial days. I'm not gonna walk you through all the numbers since folks have a copy of this to look at, but did want to mention that there are some boxes that are colored green. And so in this scenario, uh, if the box is green, we are meeting our management objective. If the box were to be red, that would indicate places where we are over our management objective. In this particular model, we are at 11.4% for Willapa River and 13.2% for Nacelle Rivers, reminding folks that our guidance is to achieve 20% in both Willapa and Nacelle Rivers for Chinook. The bottom table is what the fishery would look like. Again, this is based on the NALF run. So it's important to note that this model that we're sharing with you tonight, this model A, it's just our starting model. And that will change as we receive fishery suggestions over the next month. So when we look at this, uh, this NALF run here, you can see that we have green boxes across the board, which indicate that we do have some room to work with providing opportunity with Chinook and Coho, and also some room with Chum. So this time that wraps up my part of the presentation. And we do have staff here to listen and take down your fishery suggestions, whatever they may be. And our goal for the next time that we meet in April will be to provide you with any modeled suggestions uh, that meet all of our man management objectives uh, from you folks uh, on the line. And, and throughout the next month, you'll be able to put it on, 
put it online. So again, thank you for taking the time to let us present to you tonight. And at this time, we wanna hear from you on your fisheries suggestions and proposals. So it looks like we have a hand already from phone number ending in 445. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. This is Steve Gacky from NACEL. And I have several comments specific to the NACEL River. Um, there have been several incidents of closed water fishing below the hatchery prior to October 16th. Um, evidently, since it is open for trout, enforcing salmon fishing rules is dicey. Need to amend the rule to correct this. And I think maybe enforcement is on top of this, but uh, perhaps by prohibiting trout fishing in this section from August 1st through October 15th. Um, many riverfront landowners have crawfish fees as part of their Labor Day gathering. So please make sure crawfishing needs to be allowed during that time. Don't have a total closure. Um, also with increased returns of Chinook and decent coho numbers, staff may be inclined to increase bag limits. Increased opportunities in the tributaries can be a two-edged sword based on my experience. Large bag limits keep fishers on the river and overcrowding and reduced harvest may occur. I would support a two-fish bag for the nacelle. Coho met escapement this year with a strong run of fish and a lot of rain. My rain gauge recorded 133 inches. The river was out on numerous occasions, which I am sure helped escapement. Escapement had not been made for four of the five previous years. Even if abundance allows, I would like to see no wild retention for at least three years, three-year cycle to restore historical escapement. If you intend to allow wild retention, please limit it to one fish. The emergency rule for coastal steelhead is impacting the harvest of hatchery late coho with the bait ban, as the peak of the run typically is the first two weeks in December. There needs to be some consideration for successful harvest on lates during the peak of the run other than surplusing them. Snagging Chinook with twitching jigs just continues to be a big problem on the nacelle. While jigs are highly effective in generating an aggressive strike for coho, they're being used for Chinook due to their foul hooking ability. If no one is looking, those illegal fish are bonked in the head and thrown in the bushes. Last year it became obvious when the twitching began as the bite was off about an hour after sunrise. In years past on bobber and bait, we could continue till very late in the morning. At the 2020 North of Falcon, I addressed this problem, requested a rule change. Nothing happened. At the 2021 North of Falcon, I submitted a petition with 54 signatures of local fishers requesting a restrictive rule. Staff reply was, this is not being done anywhere in the state. Based on our observations, twitching jigs use, use continues in, to increase and in foul hooking in an estimated 95%. 95% of those fish that are hooked with a jig are foul hooked. This, this is based on our being on the river every day and seeing what's going on. The regulation on page eight under gear rules, which says you may not, says, snag or attempt to snag. On page 17, it defines snagging as an effort to take fish with a hook and line in a manner that fish does not take the hook or hooks voluntarily in the mouth. This problem is growing each year due to rat lack of regulation enforcement and is affecting the ability to legally catch fish. I've talked to game wardens. They would like to see a change here. Something needs to be done. Rather than revising general rules and make a big deal out of it, I suggest you include the following for the section of Nacelle River from the confluence of the South Fork 
to the Highway 4 bridge. The rule would be the act of twitching will be considered an attempt to snag and is prohibited August 1 through September 30th. Use an ACL as a test for this rule and expand it to other streams if you choose. Typically, Coho do not arrive in good numbers until early October. Keep area from Highway 4 Bridge to the hatchery closed October 15th until October 15th to ensure escapement goals for Chinook are met. And my last comment is regarding the uh, rebuild uh, for the nacelle hatchery. Uh, it's been mentioned by staff at previous meetings uh, about a state-of-the-art facility, which we're excited about, but there are concerns that fishers have, landowners have. Um, I'm wondering, is there anyone in staff that could provide the timeline for the permitting process, specifically the notification and comment period for the in-water work? There's going to be some significant uh, navigation issues with by raising that weir up and uh, would appreciate some feedback on that. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, Steve. James Lussie here. Thanks for all those comments. So you might have seen us frantically taking notes here. Um, so we I think we tracked everything you said. Um, in terms of nacelle rebuild, uh, I think maybe it might be a little bit out of the scope for this meeting, but it's important that you get all the details you want. Rob Allen is here. Rob, I'm just going to maybe confirm that you tracked that and maybe we can circle back with Steve here um, and give him the timeline. Um, and a lot of those topics that Steve that you flagged, Rob and I are talking about um, passage of boats and things like that. So um, does that make sense, Steve? Yes, it does. And I, I've communicated with Rob before. Yeah. Uh, great guy to work with. I'll be, I'd be happy to contact him. And if, if you, if it make it easy for you guys, I can just send you uh, my comments so you don't have to have a bunch of notes. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. And it's good for us too, just to make sure we didn't miss something. So that's great, but it also is great to have you be here and um, say them out loud. So really appreciate it. But yeah, shoot us an email too. And then uh, Rob and I will reach out to you and make sure you kind of see the master plan for that rebuild because it's uh it's handy and it's easy info to share so thanks for flagging that okay Th thank you james and our next hand is from eric i have allowed you to unmute yourself hey good evening can you hear me yeah we can hear you all right great thank you um, my comment is about North River, um, coho, uh, recreational coho fishery in particular. Uh, looking at your numbers, you have projected for uh, wild spawner escapement of 13,600 for uh, Willapaw Bay in general. And the forecast, if I read it right, was 25,376 uh, wild escapement or wild return. So there's over 12,000 available wild coho for some kind of potential take. And I understand the majority of the coho are modeled for commercial um, September through mid-October. <clears throat> um, I would like, and North River was shut last year for any kind of recreational fishing. Um, I would like to request, um, if possible, to get North River reopened for some limited recreational fishery. Um, it's uh, been open for decades. Um, it's a small fishery, it's a local fishery, but it's an important fishery to us. And with the projected available um, wild numbers returning, um, it seems reasonable to me, even with the, um, the focus on commercial harvest, could there possibly be a, a small chunk of that set aside for uh, freshwater recreational, maybe a one fish limit? So I'd just like you to consider that. Thank you, that's all I had. Thanks, Eric, we have that written down. Appreciate the comment. Okay, thank you. And we don't have another hand right now. So just to remind folks, if you're on a cell phone and would like to raise your hand, dial star nine. 
And you may need to find it under the reactions tab on the bottom of your screen, depending on which, which type of Zoom you have. Um, and our, looks like we have a hand up from Cindy. Cindy, I have allowed you to talk. Hello there, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, well, I'm Cindy Pierce. My name is Cindy Pierce and I uh, live on the NACEL. I've attended a couple of these, uh, these Zoom meetings before and uh, I, I always come back with a different, uh, kind of a different vision of what you're talking about here. And, and that vision is uh, being a landowner. And I've got quite a bit of land on both sides of the Nacelle River above the, the bridge. Uh, and so we have, we open on in October. And as soon as October opens up, we have, um, I don't know what, what shows up. Uh, it's, I, I tell you, it's, it's the people that come to fish here, and I will go back to what Steve says. You know, you talk about snagging. We have most of the fishermen that come down here are snaggers, and they'll bring three, four poles with them, and uh, they'll just you know leave with five to ten fish. And um, I don't even call fish and game anymore because they are very di they're they're so. Well, they just can't get here in time. And by the time they get here, the, the fishermen are gone. And so I'm finding that the other day, right before the last day, right before it ended, um, I had a fisherman walking in my cow field and I asked him to not trespass. And he started <laughs> using four letter words and I'm really tired of it. I'm tired of asking people to get off of my property and getting that kind of a response. And it's very frustrating to me. The other day, I take my dogs out. I'll tell you again, one of my dogs disappeared. I went looking for him. About a half hour later, I found him. He was on the river, tied up on his leg with fishing line. He could not get out of the fishing line. And it took me forever to get him out of that. Um, it's wrong. It's just wrong. And uh, I don't, the answer to me, the answer is to not allow the fishing, to not allow them to come and fish, whether that be above the nacelle bridge, maybe you could set some time, you know, set some area aside by the, the hatchery. Um, but a lot of those hatchery people that park at the hatchery, they walk down here and then they start snagging and then they walk back up to their cars and pretend that everything's just fine. And I'm in an area where you can, you can hide pretty easily. I caught two people just the other day hiding behind some logs that came in from the last flood and, um, you know, right on trespassing on the property. So I'm looking at this whole fishing. I love the fact that we've got fish. But I hate the fact that now every time fishing opens, I feel like I have to be aware of trespassers on my property. And I just don't think it's fair. It's just not fair that they're on my property. And I'd like to either see something done about it or close the fisheries in a certain area. Um, I know I'm not the only landowner on the river that feels the same. And uh, I just want to give you my two cents on that. Thank you. Cindy, message received. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And looks like our next hand is from Marlisa. Marlisa, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. And if you're on a phone, you may need to dial star six. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, hi, thank you. I have um, several issues that I would like to discuss with you tonight. And while it's fresh in my mind, I'd like to address Steve Gacky's comment about twitching with jigs. And I couldn't agree more. I also saw some flagrant problems with twitching and um, on the North Nema. And so if you can add that anti-jigging rule and include the North Nema with that, it would be helpful. I, I couldn't agree more that 
Um, you know, for a coho, it, it's appropriate in the right type of water level, but um, the Chinook salmon are not going after a jig. And the only reason they're using it, using it is to foul hook it. And, you know, 9.5 out of 10 times any fish that they're into, it's, it's foul hooked. So I, I can support him with that comment. Um, I have a lot of other things I'd like to talk about. Um, first, there with this year's predicted returns uh, on Chinook below conservation goal levels, um, while we're still trying to get at the abundant hatchery return on Chinooks, the North Nema is still the last great place for a fisher to go and have a meaningful opportunity to catch a Chinook, where if you get to the river and you're there during the right tide, you're and you're using the right kind of bait, you're pretty certain that you're gonna take home a fish. Um, I cannot support putting the nets in to the bay prior to September 15th, north or south. The Chinook are designated as a recreational priority. And in order to fulfill that priority, you have to allow fish to come through to freshwater and to the bay in meaningful numbers that allow a freshwater or marine fisher to get a fish. Statistics show that it takes seven to eight trips per boat to catch one fish out in the bay. And this is in part due to the change of Chinook production in the north, but also it has to do with the nets going in far too early. If we have fortunate, and if we are fortunate enough to have an abundance, abundance of Chinook early, then we need to be looking at in-season management with raising bag limits. And I would propose that with the abundance coming back towards the NEMA, that we do a bag limit increase from August 1st until September 5th of three, and after that, reduce it to two. Any early fish that are coming into the river can in large numbers cause problems for the hatchery up above and allowing the recreational priority to take place and give them an opportunity to catch an extra fish over the two fish bag limit for that short period of time, I think would be a great gesture from fish and wildlife. We cannot achieve that recreational priority consistently and keep putting nets back in in the North and the South. And what I see happening is just dishonest manipulation of the policy that we created to prevent this by standing down those terms that are in the 2015 Willapaw policy. We, it, I, I don't know, I, I'm so frustrated with you folks because um, it seems that the minute we say something about coho fishing, I get slapped down and said, oh, but that's a priority for the commercial. So you don't have any say there, but yet they are making comments about wanting to put the nets in early so that they can get at those fish without addressing their impacts on wild coho. And I think you need to give us the same respect for our recreational priority on Chinook that you're giving them on coho. And let's see, it seems like I had one more comment and it is relating to wild coho with um, some abundance expected. I think that I would like to see two things done, one wild coho allowed in North River and one wild coho allowed in the North Nema. And I would also like to see one chum per day allowed in the North Nema. The, the rules give priority on chum to the commercial sector, but it seems to me that they have 100% of the take. North Nema, in my estimation, is producing probably more than 50% of the chum that the bay produces, and yet a recreational fisher on fresh water doesn't have an opportunity to catch one. So let's change that for this year. Give us one chum, one wild coho, three Chinook bag limit starting August 1st through September 5th, reducing it to two after that. And I would remind everyone that just because there's a three fish bag limit, 
doesn't mean that people catch three fish. Not every fisher is created equal. And that truthfully, even without the nets in the bay, prior to September 5th or September 15th, there aren't that many fish in fresh water. So when you put the nets in in front, that takes out two weeks of possible opportunity where if you had 10 guys on the river, maybe one guy would catch a fish August 1st through August 15th. There just aren't very many. But the minute you put the nets in, there is zero opportunity. So I'd like some honest consideration and some feedback on my request. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Martha. So there's a lot there, but um, I know that every one of the regulation changes you talked about, um, bag limit changes, shifting emphasis on species from freshwater, uh, from commercial to sport and freshwater, these things are all being noted. So um, I think the best way to get feedback here is to stay in touch with us on the process and then um, uh, keep in touch with Jody and I as we design these fisheries. So thanks. Appreciate everything you said. In other words, screw you. Yeah, hey, Marley, so I'm gonna ask that we be a little bit more respectful here on these calls. Um, we're being really serious about what we're hearing from you and, and we really do appreciate your feedback, so thanks. And our next hand is from a caller ending in 932. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Hello, yeah, this is Ross Barkhurst. Comments, uh, number one, uh, the, the wild Chinook trend is not good in the nasal, uh, and I would attribute it to some of this uh, very early netting and 20% uh, uh, mortality rate, if and when you think there's room for it, there hasn't been room for it. For the first three years of the policy, when it was less molested, uh, 725 uh, wild, uh, it up, showed up at the Nazel hatchery for the last three, 19, 20, and 21, 527 average. And that's where uh, a lot of it uh, closed this last year. And so uh, we do need to get back to the concept of the policy uh, uh, after Labor Day, September 10th, something like that. Uh, otherwise, we don't get, and our only priority is freshwater now. The, the, the bay, the bay fishing for our priority is gone due to the conservation measures in the north. And so that's one item. Another item is that, that we definitely need to be able to get on the, the chum in the, the Nemo River. And uh, we just don't need to be closing on October 1st. I looked at the, the hatchery rack reports okay, as of uh, November 7th, the Nemo hatchery has, has seen 26 wild coho. And the idea I talked about last year, I fished that river before you started closing it many years. And uh, in October, first four, five, six days of November, I averaged less than one wild coho a year. Most of the time you could keep them. If you need to turn it loose, fine. One isn't gonna make much difference. And so uh, we don't need to be closing off the sport fishing in the fresh water when it's all we've got left. Uh, I think we could afford a chum limit of two. Uh, we've been uh, nagging uh, chum in the Williams Creek to get eggs into the hatchery. And uh, last year, uh, uh, they literally spawned a little over 2,000 chum, released 1,400 uh, from the hatchery. And so you know, we're there. We don't need to be, uh, we don't need to be uh, snagging the wild ones off the nest. They're precious. And uh, we don't need to be closing it for chum fishing. Uh, the recreational priority for Chinook is all we've got. Uh, I would note that the enforcement is, is very important. Uh, I would note that in the, poly in the uh, budget this year, there is several million dollars for enhanced enforcement. And I think that we should uh, try that before we, close, uh, the, before we close the biggest run of hatchery Chinook we have in the Nazelle all the way through uh, October. Uh, all the way through uh, September and into October 15th. We don't need to do that. If you, if you really think, I would ask enforcement if they think that switching is a problem, knock off switching uh, until after October 15th. But uh, uh, we just don't need to uh, 
there's almost nothing left. But you got the Nema River, and if you net in front of it uh, before uh, Labor Day, you cut that down. And so uh, we need a, a little uh, a little room to uh, breathe for sport fishermen. Uh, it's too bad that the north end of the bay is totally closed. It takes eight days in a boat to get a Chinook up there. Uh, when the coho netting, and I would hope that the enforcement would, would be applied to the nets. You can go to Main Street in South Bend and see nets with uh, netting, yield net boats with netting uh, violations of the netting gear rules that are obvious to the casual observer, and uh, you just don't ever see it, it being enforced. Uh, uh, somebody who's trying to catch coho in the Willapa River is just out of luck. You can't even get your boat around in there. People are giving up. And so, you know, we need a little room for, for the coho fishing. But the main thing is with the Chinook priority, we need to let them get into the river. That'll give us more wild fish and it'll give us a shot at uh, uh, Chinook retention. Uh, 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 Ms. Marlisa recommended a Chinook limit of three. If, if somehow you think in your modeling that that harms too many wild Chinook uh, or it takes too many pins i don't think it does but if it, you think it does then an alternative i suggested last year is make the limit three but if you want three only only one can be a hen two need to be bucks uh the uh uh nema hatchery uh, uh the nema hatchery sells thousands thousands of hatchery chinook that could have been caught uh we just don't need to to uh, nail the females while we're doing it that's my suggestions. Thanks, Ross, for those. We have taken those down and uh, we'll, we'll take those into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. And our next hand is from Norm. Norm, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, folks. This is Norm Reinhardt. How y'all doing? Um, a couple of hey, things. Hey, Norm, it's good to see you. Yep, a couple of things. One, will um, Washaway Beach, the control zone, be open this year? That's my first question. Um, and then my, 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 my next statement is as I've watched the policy be altered, um, some of us would say um, gutted, but I'll, I'll use the word altered. Um, it's been a long, bitter fight down there in Willow Bay for as long as I've been involved in it. Uh, and it sounds like it's still going on. The recreational Chinook priority should be maintained in the whole bay through at least September 5th, Labor Day weekend, as it has been in the past. And as far as Coho and Chum, I understand the commercial priorities there. However, we have de facto sharing of the recreational Chinook harvest by opening up the commercial fishery earlier. They are taking some Chinook. I don't see why that, that same philosophy, philosophy can't be given to the coho and chum recreational fishery, not an equal sharing, but at least carve out a small part of that run to allow some, some coho harvest and some chum, chum harvest, especially in rivers or in river. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is, um, I hope there's a whole bunch of recreational fishermen listening tonight. And if they aren't, um, I would like truly to um, see it put in print. The, the one lady, the one landowner, the one lady that was talking early on to the recreational fishing community, which I am a part of, we have alienated every landowner in this state by the actions of a small segment of the recreational community. And that's unfortunate. We have brought it 
on ourselves by not being willing to participate with the landowners in helping them and helping WDFW catch the perpetrators that are trespassing, catch the folks that are snagging. If we want to regain access, because you've got one of the most beautiful areas in the state to fish, but very, very limited access to the rivers, very limited. Clean up your act. And a follow on to that, I would hope that sometime in the future, because of land access issues, that the state can figure out a way to work with landowners to allow limited access, whether it's by permit or whatever, to the recreational community um, so that they can partic participate in harvesting some salmon. It's a, it's a far stretch of what we do today, but it's being used in other parts of this nation successfully. And it may be time for us to consider to do the same here in Washington state. So um, I guess I wanna get off my high horses. I'm glad to hear a lot of familiar base voices. Um, but I guess my big question is Washaway Beach, the control zone. Thank you. Good evening, Norm. Uh, Mark Baltzell, uh, Statewide Salmon and Steelhead Manager. Uh, thanks for your comments. I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, address the wash away question. So for now, uh, as things are modeled, uh, that is open. Uh, as folks, I'm sure, are paying attention to the ocean options, uh, and if you were listening in to the um, Columbia River North of Falcon meeting last week, uh, obviously those Thule impacts this year are a consideration in all the fisheries. Um, we know that uh, um, uh, even uh, with the data that we've been collecting in the, the Creole programs shows that uh, um, if we were to implement that uh, control zone closure this year, that there's really very little savings. Um, uh, and it's been great that we've had these monitoring programs in, in place to collect that information um, over the years about where people are catching fish. We've been able to look at those tag recoveries in the recent years, and, and we can use that data to inform that decision making. So I think as of now, um, uh, it's modeled open and, and that's our plan moving forward, but I, I don't want to just uh, outright say that uh, it won't be considered for closure, um, but I think uh, as we're thinking about it more broadly, uh, we're hoping that those Thule rates can, uh, those things can be worked out between the ocean and Columbia River fisheries, and we won't have to, to uh, involve the, the Willapaw seasons. Hope that answers your questions. Thank you. And <clears throat> thanks, Mark. I really appreciate you jumping in there with kind of the bigger perspective. Uh, we've heard of multiple comments to, you know, from Norm and others around uh, angler behavior and uh, private property. Uh, the twitching jig rule kind of overlaps with some of that. So I feel like maybe just worth saying, Norm and others, we hear you. I want to remind folks um, with the private property issue, you know, and of course, enforcement does help um, with that. But uh, I also want to make sure folks know that if folks are in, if anglers or anyone is entering their private property, calling 911 is a good alternative to call in enforcement. Um, and then when we talk about the twitching jigs and the private property issues together and angler behavior, um, with this supplemental budget package that maybe folks have heard a lot about that includes a lot of freshwater monitoring work. Also, we saw um, you know, some, some funds uh, funneled to enforcement that results in uh, increased capacity for them. Um, so that's good. Uh, we also hope in the next biennium um, that uh, future kind of funding cycles improve on that even more. So that's like enforcement capacity. Uh, that's really important and applies to the jig fishing rule, uh, the twitching jig rule that a lot of folks are referencing, because we know that sometimes gear regulations can help with that, but we already have, as folks have referenced, regulations in the pamphlet 
that restrict people from uh, snagging fish. Um, so we have an enforcement challenge there to cap, you know, capture that when we see it happening. So while a jig fishing rule may help, we know that folks that want to snag fish are pretty effective at doing it, um, you know, regardless of the rules in some cases. So all that said, this jig fishing rule is not a Willapa Bay specific issue or a um, nacelle or NEMA specific issue. We're also seeing it in North Puget Sound. We're uh, hearing from folks in certain parts of Hood Canal that this issue needs to be addressed, angler behavior, um, and then also Grace Harbor. So we've got an angler behavior challenge that's um, something that the agency is talking about, ways to address it. Um, and some of that includes uh, looking at gear restrictions that may help us there. So I wanna let folks know if you feel like you've mentioned this for a couple of years in a row, your voice is being heard and we're trying to come up with a consistent way to deal with it that we are confident it's gonna be effective. So just wanna make sure folks don't think we're just like kind of writing this down and then throwing it away after the meeting. It's part of the bigger plan. So thanks for the help and um, yeah, keep voicing that concern, please. Okay, and it looks like Marlisa has her hand back up. Marlisa, I have allowed you to unmute. Thank you for taking my second comment. Um, first of all, uh, please excuse my last comment. You weren't, that wasn't supposed to be something that was still on the air, but I do have some more things I'd like to say. And it, it is regard to netting in the Willapa River. I constantly have people call me uh, down at the NEMA where I'm there during the salmon season and say, did you, did you see the net that was stretched bank to bank in the Willapa? And I, I bring it up because in some of my old heritage documents, there's some laws that were passed back in the 1940s that limited the length of a gill net to no more than one third the width of the river. Is there any way that we can revisit such a restriction for gill netting in the mouth of the Willapa and other rivers? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I don't have the answer to it right now. I'm going to pause and make sure that there's not someone here in the team that does. But um, if not, Marlisa, maybe give us a shot at that one. We can regroup, um, explore the history of this a little bit, and then circle back with you, if that makes sense. I had a, a, a gill netter who asked a game warden, this is third hand that said, hey, you know, what, what do I do? You know, because the tides change, my net drifts. And the game warden said, well, do the best you can. So I do feel that there's often a double standard with chasing down someone that has got a barbed hook versus, uh, you know, a netter that's, you know, blatantly bank to bank out there in areas where, where they shouldn't be. So thank you for taking my comment. And I just would like to put it into perspective that um, you know, while there should be zero tolerance for snagging and this twitching issue that's coming along, I hope you do work on that. I, I also think that um, you know, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of strife down here in Willapa between the gill netters, and there are not very many of them, and the recreational fishing decline which is consistent. And, um, and I, I, I would like someone to reach out to me privately, set up some meetings so I could talk about these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Marlisa. And our next hand is from Greg. Greg, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. You got me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, hey, uh, commercial fisherman here, bad netter, and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, we're. Uh, um, I hope I hope the department decides to fish again in August. I think that's good. I think it gets a lot of Chinook that end up up these rivers and die. 
it's you know if we get the early end of that run knocked back a little bit so um, I, I hope you guys still plan on doing the same thing this year and uh, like to see a few more coho days and a little bit better in season management for you know coho and chum um we had a lot of you know we had a lot of chum get by and uh you know we you know it was actually a, a good year we, we we could have had a good year on them but uh anyway um I, i'd like you guys to look into that a little, little better in season management on that you know when we saw the numbers that we saw we should have fished more um and uh yeah, and I, I don't think there's a commercial fisherman around that would disagree that that I have no problem with them if they want if the recreational want to catch a chum go go for it. But uh, um, also, um, I'd like uh, on another side note or on another flip the coin here is uh, I, I really agree with what Cindy was saying on the nacelle. Um, there is there is issues. I'm a landowner on nacelle. And um, there is issues there, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can find a, a way to resolve it. And uh, you know, uh, I appreciate Norm saying that too. Is 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 it is a problem? It is a problem at five o'clock in the morning when somebody's walking through your yard, you know, getting down to the river, and it does happen. You know, I mean, it 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 it's just just trying to get the jump on everybody else, but you know. So it, it does happen and there is quite, you know, I, I won't say my confrontations are as bad as hers because, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, a, I, I think it's a little, little different, but, uh, but also too, I would like to that, uh, October 15th, all the closure in the, um, in the nacelle, I, I, I've always said, I feel like, you know, from the bridge to the hatchery is they've got to have a place to go where they can spawn or you know rest and do their thing so i really support that but there is definitely and i know you can talk to the to the uh law enforcement because they've talked to me about it is you have to close some of these trout loopholes that you've got going on during that time frame where they can you know people can say oh i'm fishing for trout you know and and, and it did happen it happened numerous times you know, so um, I, I think you have to, you know, if you're going to close that area, you know, you need to close, close fishing down, you know, and, and, uh, um, and then uh, let her go. But anyway, that's what I got. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, for the comment. We've got it written down. And that was our last hand. Just to remind folks, um, if you're on the phone, star nine to raise your hand. Oh, here we go. Uh, and last four ending in four, four, five. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Hey, um, after hearing some of the comments, uh, uh, Norm uh, touched on something that uh, Greg and Cindy are talking about, and I'm very familiar with. Um, and that's, you know, he talked about the outreach to landowners. And, and years ago, 30 years ago, that's the way it worked. Uh, 30 years ago, I went to a meeting with Cindy's father. They were going to close the nacelle totally because they had no enforcement. He didn't want any fishing above the bridge until the 15th of October, 16th of October, because of the problems they were having with the illicit activity and the snagging at night. I was there for my son, who was 12 years old at the time, to try to keep it open below the bridge so that there's a place for him to fish. And out of that came an agreement that it would be closed above the bridge to the hatchery until October 16th. And the Holmes family honored that. They allowed public access when the river opened up on the 16th. And uh, in 2015, when the recreational advisors demanded that section of river be opened, and I was an advisor then, and I told them, don't do it. Don't, you don't want to do it. 
they did it, and look what you got. And so this goes to Norm. Hats off to you, Norm. Thank you for bringing this up. This is important. Um, landowners have to have uh, a piece of this. They, they should have a say. And uh, I, I had an experience uh, this year that is really quite uh, troubling to me. But uh, I'd, I'd like someone to explain to me who and why Fish and Wildlife staff are researching deeds and then telling landowners they only own to the top of the bank and they will not respond to trespassing concerns. Now, I, I heard those words from the enforcement officer, and I'm not going to say his name, but those words were made. Now, why the hell are enforcement people or anybody in Fish and Wildlife looking at deeds instead of outreaching and trying to open doors and knock down barriers. This, this is just beyond belief, simply beyond belief. And so when, when you listen to Cindy, understand what she's dealing with. This is what she is dealing with. And it, it's, it's not right. And honestly, whoever was reading those deeds, I'll guarantee you, is not an attorney. And they don't know the laws. The state owns to ordinary high water, and that's it. They can't just say, well, oh, well, they own to the bank, so we're going to take that too. That is not the way it works. And, you know, I, I don't know where Cindy's going to go with this, but uh, <laughs> heads up, folks. So th this is this something's not right with how landowners are being treated on the nacelle. And you've got to get control of this. So make that a priority, please. And thank you again to Norm for bringing that up. And the last thing, um, I, I think it may have been James. I didn't have a name there, but was talking about uh, kind of summarizing some of the comments about the jig fishing and it's in other places. You know, I thought about this now for several years. I first, I first went at it from the standpoint of getting rid of the jigs. The jigs aren't the problem. It's the technique of twitching, the raising and lowering of the rod. That raising and lowering drops that bait down below the fish. The bringing it up pulls it right up into their belly. It's just, it just, it's just natural snagging. You eliminate the twitching, you eliminate the jigs. Because <laughs> what are you going to do? Just reel it out and then reel it back. I, I think that that is really the avenue you need to look at in, in solving this. This this need this needs to get dealt with this year. It's just it's becoming uh, quite contentious on the river. We're tired of it, and we're letting fishers know. Uh, I, the game wardens I've talked to are tired of it. They would like to see a change. So please, please enact something this year so that we, we can have a reasonable fishery and, uh, um, you know, and, and increase our bag limits. Uh, th this is going to increase productivity if you enforce some kind of a rule on that. So th th thank you very much, and I apologize for my passion. Hey, I didn't get the name of that last caller. Um, if you don't mind this repeating. Steve it. Oh, that's Steve, Steve again. Jackie. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Please don't apologize for the passion. Um, you know, that's what fuels this whole thing. So really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So you, I think you highlighted uh, the complexity around that jig uh, rule that it's not just a, a gear rule, it's a behavior rule, it's a, a method. So um, this is the kind of thing we're wrestling with. So thanks for for flagging that it's a little more complicated than just checking, you know, changing the thing you tie on the end of your hook. So um, anyway, appreciate the comment and, and um, appreciate the passion. Thank you. And it looks like we have another hand from caller ending in 932. I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Thank you. This is Ross Barkerist again. I, I can't overemphasize the necessity to call 911 of the sheriff. Uh, we own land on the bay. We have oysters and some clams. And if and when people are trespassing on our land, uh, the last thing that, that we would do would be to uh, call WFW and ask them to close the recreational clamming. You, you, have, you have to get enforcement involved. And I would say that, they, that, that 
that they've been pretty good about it. And the word gets out and, and uh, end of problem. But uh, uh, we just can't, uh, we can't have a situation where uh, the bad guys are the recreational fishers. And you can see uh, gill nets 90%, greater than 90% across the river and nobody does a thing. I won't name names either, but I've talked to some gill netters and they say, well, the word from enforcement is just be reasonable. Don't worry about the fact that your ball is on the bottom over there. Don't worry about the fact that, that the, the, the line is way longer than 90 feet across the river. Uh, uh, just be reasonable. And uh, we need both sides to uh, clamp their act, and we need the leadership and the guidance from the department and enforcement. And you were right. You know, if somebody's trespassing on your land, uh, uh, you know, we have people show up at our house. See, is this a good place for a picnic? No, I'm sorry. You know, and uh, 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 it just involves uh, law enforcement in addition to uh, game enforcement, and uh, it's tough, but that's what you got to do. Thank you. Thank you. And our next hand is from Keith. Keith, I have allowed you to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I'm new to Zoom, so I don't know if you're hearing this or, or not. Yeah, we can hear you. <clears throat> uh, I've got questions about different subjects. I've been trying to understand the wild fish recovery. And <clears throat> as wild fish seems to dictate all seasons and quotas, I have some misunderstandings, I guess, of some of the data here. This model A NALF refers to natural origin Chinook escapement for this year. It's got a number of 2695. The three hatcheries on the Willapaw Bay in the last two years have received an average of 2457 natural Chinook. That leaves the rest of the estuary needing 238 fish. This seems totally unreasonable to me. Are these returns being given any credit? That's question one. I'd rather have an answer before I go into the others. Hey, Joe, do you want to take a stab at that one or? Yeah, Keith, I'm having a hard time following your numbers um, exactly. Are, we have it up on the screen now. Are you referring to something on, on this page that I can help walk you through? Uh, yeah, expected escapement, natural origin Chinook. Yep, so those are the, so what you're looking at here is the NALF run. So these are new abundances placed on last year's fishery. So what the expected escapement is, is 2695 is what we expect uh, for natural Chinook to return this using, year. using year. last year's fishery, not, not this, no fisheries are crafted this year yet. Does that help? You, no, you've projected 3,071. That's our forecast, correct. Okay, let's use that number then. You forecasted 3,071. And I'm telling you, 2,457 have come back to the three hatcheries in the last two years. They've been turned upstream. I, all my questions have been posted on North of Falcon public page, and I have a lot of them. But this is one of them I don't understand. How can you take three hatcheries that are receiving fish natural fish, turn them back upstream. And this is successful, by the way, because they weren't turning anything upstream 10 years ago. And it amounts to almost 2,500 fish. And this year, your prediction is 3,071. That leaves all North River. It leaves everything to fill in a missing 238 fish. I don't think these numbers are right. 
Keith, I'd be happy to um, kind of unpack a lot of this with you after the meeting or, or tomorrow even um, and have a conversation with you uh, to try to walk you through kind of our values and our numbers and, and where they all come from. I'd be happy to set that up with you. Apparently, success is not one of them because returning fish tells me everything you need to know. We're trying to save the wild salmon, which I'm all for, by the way. I just don't understand the numbers. When you've got success in front of us, 2,400 fish, and you're projecting 3,000? Does yeah, that think, not make sense? Keith, I think we might have a kind of um communication challenge here with uh, hatchery origin versus naturally origin fish, uh, those entering the spawning ground versus those the hatchery. And so, and the, the challenge might be on our end, not yours. So it, I think what Jody's saying is if we took, you know, 30 minutes on the side here to walk through the spreadsheet and the numbers, we might all be able to kind of speak the same language. Okay. Well, fine. I'll move on to the next one. That's, uh, yeah, sorry for the confusion on that one, Keith. Okay. Willapaw Bay total expected harvest coho. You show recreational at 3983. I'm not going to argue with that because I don't even know where the numbers come from and I don't know where to find them for the wreck. I can find easily the commercial landings for the last two years. The commercials last year landed 24,000 fish. We've got a better year coming up right now, and they're only projecting 17, 18,000 for the commercials. That doesn't seem right to me, for one. I, I don't, unless you're cutting them off. And that leads into my last question, basically, and that's, I'd like to see another column here on harvest and it should be called surplus. The surplus harvest at the hatchery is a resource and it's utilized by the state of Washington. It's the largest user of all of the resources and it's never accounted for. It's, it's overlooked, it's sidestepped, it's whistling past the graveyard and as I've heard today in this meeting everybody's happy to keep the commercials and the recreational people at each other's throat and nobody talks about surplus i think it should be part of the modeling that's shown on these on these uh, graphs like this one that's it thank you Hey, Keith, thanks for your comments. And uh, please let's link up after this so I can help uh, walk you through this or, or any other of our other values where you though there might be some confusion there. And I can I can try to we can try to come to con some consensus there. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and Keith, your comment that including the surplus hatchery fish, fish that returned through the fishery, you know, didn't end up on the spawning grounds that showed up at their hatchery rack that's an easy number to stick in a, a spreadsheet like this. So yeah, thanks for the comment there. <clears throat> Sorry. And that was our um, last hand for now. If anybody else needs, uh, well, has a comment and needs to know how to raise their hand, it is star nine on a cell phone or under the reactions tab on Zoom. Maybe this would be a good time to review kind of future dates and see if anybody has any more questions. Oh, I see that Marlisa has her hand back up. Um, Marlisa, I have allowed you to talk. Thank you. Um, one more question. There has been quite a bit of rumor going around that there's talk of changing the Nema hatchery into a chum factory alone. 
Is there any truth to this? Hello? I think we're trying to decide, Marlisa, who's the best person to take this question. Um, I can maybe give it a, a shot. And if Rob or James wants to jump in, um, I, I think the the plan uh, that we that staff has laid out for the commission and that's still under consideration is the the hatchery production piece. Uh, I'm sure folks on this call know that that um, uh, the staff recommendation was to to uh, let the the new hatchery policy uh, be our guide and some of those steps that were. Uh, trying to implement there with developing hatchery management plans uh, for each of these facilities. Uh, and that that uh, in turn can help guide our, our management for, for production levels at these facilities as we go forward. So those things are still under consideration. I know James and Rob have um, done some, some other stuff with uh, constituents in the Bay with uh, RSI projects. I know that's something that we're also exploring in relation to CHUM within the basin, uh, but I don't think we've landed anywhere specific uh, on what those future production levels look like uh, within the basin with any of these programs. So maybe I'll just uh, take a step back there and see if James or Rob has anything they want to add or if I got something wrong there. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add, Mark. The the piece of that question that had kind of, uh, you know, a light bulb going off is Marlisa, I was wondering if you were talking specifically about co-op projects, because that's some work Rob and I have done kind of, but more grassroots with the folks that are working on recovery and harvest supplementation with CHUM programs. So thinking about the best place for those programs to exist, but um, nope, I'm, I'm with what Mark was saying. That made sense to me, so. No, that's not what I'm referring to. So I know I've been at this a long time. You know, I helped craft the 2015 policy and was an advisor before that for several years. And so this rumor keeps coming down the pike. Every time we're at a commission meeting, Commissioner McIsaac always talks about changing that NEMA hatchery into a chum factory. And it always seems to be a slap in the face to me about the recre recreational opportunity that goes on there. So the NEMA hatchery, the NEMA river by itself has more Chinook catch for that river alone than the entire rest of the recreational freshwater fishery in the Bay. And so I would give that a, a wholehearted no if anyone is thinking of that. Um, I would say that would be a bad decision. So I'd like someone to reach out to me again, maybe after this meeting and discuss that because I, I didn't get a no Marlisa, we're not considering that or no Marlisa, that's not on the table at all. So is that an option that is being considered at this time? Hey Marlisa, Kelly Cunningham, um, good, to, good to hear from you this evening. So you've been following this, I'm sure you're aware that the commission is currently reviewing the Willapa policy. And no decisions have been made at this point in time. We've been asked to review some different options. Uh, there's three of them on the table as it stands right now. One we're calling kind of the status quo. Um, the committee, the fish committee itself has thrown a, another alternative into the mix. And then we've got a kind of a staff recommendation that we put forward that would allow us to, to um, manage fisheries more based on returning fish and man manage hatcheries on maximizing opportunity for both recs and commercials. So that's that's a process that's in play right now. Um, we've got a schedule for completing the, the policy review process that's gonna conclude probably September uh, of this year. So um, take a peek at the commission website. We're actually gonna be in front of them on April 1st for a uh, a uh, fish committee meeting that date and time is on the commission webpage. And uh, that's going to be important that folks listen in, track what's going on with the fish committee, and are able to uh, have their voices heard. So that's kind of where we're at with the, the Willapa policy as it as it relates to to hatchery production. I hope that helps. Not really. So is that I, I know that you know, Nacelle is supposed to be having the state-of-the-art renovations happening there. And there's the commercial fishers would love to see all prediction shifted to the south so that there's 
no interference and that they have an easy shot at getting more of these salmon that come back because it, it is more challenging for them to collect fish on the Nema Flats. They just simply can't get at them. So again, if someone can reach out to me independently and... Uh... Well, we're happy to reach out to you. I don't have an answer to your question because as I mentioned, we're in the process of this policy review and I can't predict and no one on this call can predict where our commission is gonna land this thing. So happy to have the conversation with you, but just understand that in, until the commission makes a final decision on the future of the Willapa Bay policy, there are no production changes that are in play that we are aware of, but happy to, happy to continue the conversation. Thanks. Maybe if I could just off the cuff here a little bit, Marlisa, thanks for that. And, and you know how we do some knee jerk stuff, um, you know, cause we had a few bad years of really low water there at the hatchery. And, and so staff will, will chatter about what do we do about all these Chinook and uh, that are, that are dying, you know, and they made some changes, you know, like you and Ross, I think suggested the, the dredging out of below the weir there. And, and for whatever reason, it, it, we did and it worked. Um, we also had some great flow. So some of that chatter was, gosh, maybe releasing 3.3 million Chinook was not the right idea. And so it's just the chatter. And just to be honest, it's just the chatter amongst staff, like how can we kind of resolve some of these issues? And one was maybe we're reason, rearing too many uh, Chinook that come back early when there's very little flow. So that just to be honest, that's probably all it is. And I don't, like Kelly said, I don't know where it's going, but um, kind of just chatter, if I could say that. Thank you, Rob. And it looks like our next person who is having a little ish, couple issues raising their hand. So if anybody else is having issues, um, you can let us know in the chat or an email and we can get, we can get a hold of you. Uh, but Andy Mitby, I have allowed you to unmute. About now. Yeah, we can hear you. About now. All right. Um, so just just a quick question. So I was wondering if I could get a couple model runs of the Rex having a one natural fish coho bag and the other one of them having two natural coho fish bag. And uh, one more comment is uh, somebody was asking for expanded bag limits, but the problem was of the commercial fishery and then their next comment was, we had thousands of fish to catch. So obviously the commercial fishery did not inhibit the recreational fishery. So I would strongly urge to continue with the August fisheries. That's all I got. Thanks for your Thanks. comments, Sandy. And there was someone else with a hand up just now, but it looks like the hand went down. Um, you want to raise star nine to put it back up? Oh, there we go. And I have allowed you to unmute. Uh, this is Ross Barker. I've fished the Nema for 40 years. And one of the things I've observed is, you know, back in the day, if you didn't get enough eggs uh, uh, at, at some place like the Nema, where you just got them from someplace else. Those days seem to be over. I want to congratulate the staff on following the spirit of the policy there. What I've observed is, yes, yes, Virginia, the NEMA uh, staff is doing a better job of making, making egg cake. And I think it's because they're motivated. You know, they know uh, generally the, 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 the gist of the policy is you, you don't get eggs from other rivers anymore. And so uh, I think it was something that not their fault it just wasn't something that was stressed 10 12 years ago now it is and uh I, you know before covid we watched them in action and, and they knocked themselves out to get those fish in there and take care of business and i think that that uh egg take uh, problems in the distant past are are in the distant past and uh uh, uh they're really the smallest staff the smallest hatchery and uh uh, they, by golly, they produce the most Chinook per per, per fortnight, I think. 
should be getting some credit for this. They, they work hard at getting the eggs and taking care of business. And I think it shows the difference. Okay. And that's all I have. Was, thank you. And that was our last hand up. If there's any more comments to be made, star nine to raise your hand or the panelist. I mean, sorry, no, the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. And Marlisa Dugan has raised your hand. I have unmuted you. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry that I, I'm not touching my screen, but I have been cut off twice where I can't hear the rebuttal. So I, I did not hear Rob's comments. I, I just caught a few words at the end. Um, so if Rob could readdress his comments to me about the Nema Hatchery, I would like to hear that. No. There's no way I'll be able to say it exactly the same, Marlisa. <laughs> no. Hey, uh, yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, I was just saying that, you know, when staff talk about how to address issues, um, when we have a bunch of Chinook coming back early with, with low water, and then, you know, we had some die off concerns right below, well, the nacelle and the Nema hatchery. And so we really appreciated you and Ross kind of reaching out and coming up with some ideas. But uh, we dredged that out. And last year we had really good success along with some good flow. So my point is, is that, is that we, um, in an effort to, to not have so many fish just die below the weir, the chatter was maybe we are raising too many Chinook here and we should switch over to chum when there's more water in the river so anyway it's, it's it was just chatter and like kelly said it's 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 more about what the commission's gonna discuss and decide on so so i thank you for that comment so i i would love to have some input the nema hatchery was designed for coho which obviously come a little bit later when we have a little more water and the intake into the big pond isn't really friendly to the Chinook coming in at the time of the year where they do come in. And with all this money for hatchery renovations, is it possible that we can get some money designated to the NEMA hatchery for an immediate refit of our big pond so that we can create an intake channel that's more Chinook friendly so we don't have them all stacked out there in the river um, when we occasionally get a good number earlier in August, at the end of August is when it usually happens, then we'd like to see. And the other thing I'd like to address is um, state-of-the-art water treatment plans that are coming down the pike. Why and, or when can we hope that, you know, the NEMA and the nacelle are going to be implementing some of these um, new techniques to purify our water, UV light treatment, cooling water, aerating our water. We're likely to be dealing with low flow and warmer water temperatures for quite some time. And the nacelle is much more at risk for warmer water than the NEMA is, which is creating a lot of disease and, and die off there. So is there any hope that you know, through the hatchery management team, which you are our star leading person, that we can be looking to address those issues. I myself own, and most of you who are listening probably know who I am, but you know, I have a mile of river, um, 50 acres, and I own most of it on both sides and the bottom under the river and have most of the deep holes in the lower tidal area where those fish like to come and sit. And while I advocate hey, for- Marlisa. Fresh, yes. So, sorry, maybe we should, maybe we should stick to the, the topic. And I'm really happy to talk to you about, about this stuff. I think you have my number and hey, let's hook up and chat about it. And maybe we okay. should go. Yeah, pretty excited about that. All right, well, I would love to delve into those particular topics because 
we do have problems. And, um, you know, my experience has been when I do call in mid season, when we are having a possible issue that um, those individuals that I contact kind of throw up their hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, we don't have the equipment. We, we haven't done that in this river. So I. Okay, let's, let's chat another day. Thanks, Marlisa. And it looks like that was our last hand. Um, maybe Marlene, you wanna run through the next meetings really quick? Sure, thanks, Zia. Um, let's see, I don't, I don't have that schedule right in front of me now, but our next Willapa Bay meeting uh, is gonna be on April 5th. Um, and so we look forward to having you tune in then. And again, the rest of our meetings um, are, are easily found at the link on this page um, at the bottom. Well, you can click for each individual meeting um, on each of these specific dates, uh, but the entire schedule is found at the link at the bottom. And, and again, we'll look forward to seeing on April 5th. Um, and I also just want to point out that um, if we can go back to our final question slide just one more time, please. Thank you, Barb. Um, you know, if you didn't get to uh, submit any of your fishery related comments uh, or North Falcon related comments tonight, um, please use this link here uh, and, and we're going to get those messages. We, we look at every single one. So you can do that throughout the entire process. And we really do look forward to hearing from you. And um, if you're not on our Willapa Bay distribution list, please send us an email at willapabay at dfw.wa.gov. Uh, and then you'll get all the announcements that are kind of Willapa Bay centric. Um, we're really glad that you joined us tonight and, and we really look forward to seeing you again on the 5th. Thank you. Have a nice evening.